Hey everyone, this is presentation number eight, the final presentation on 1984 for POS 499, George Orwell and 20th Century Political Life, a senior seminar taught in the Political Science Department at the University of Maine. And I'm the instructor, Rob Glover. So today we're going to talk about Orwell's final work, his final major literary work, and one of his most famous, if not his most famous work. Um, so we'll begin with a brief introduction to 1984. We'll talk about the historical context and some of the both domestic and international political events that are shaping the narrative to 1984. And then we'll close with why this book is important to understanding Orwell and why this book is important to understanding the theme of the course, 20th century political life. So we've arrived at Orwell's final work. Um, it's his darkest work. It's unrelenting. It's bleak. And uh, 1984 is positively terrifying. Um, I don't think that's an exaggeration. Uh, it's part of a, a literary genre known as uh, dystopian literature. Uh, and, and if you haven't read 1984 before, you might have encountered other examples of dystopian literature. Um, some examples that you might have encountered, uh, Brave New World by Alice Huxley, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, uh, more recently V for Vendetta, uh, another example of the dystopian genre. And actually, it's um, V for Vendetta, in a lot of ways, is kind of similar to, uh, to Orwell's vision in 1984. Um, it's the dystopian genre is really meant to establish a dark vision of the future. Uh, it's meant as a warning to those in the present. Uh, dystopia, obviously, is kind of the uh, opposite of utopia. When we talk about utopia, we're talking about a vision of perfection. We're talking about a vision of the ideal, what we ought to strive towards, what life would be like if it were absolutely perfect. Uh, dystopian narratives uh, tend to be dark. They tend to be jarring, uh, and they're meant to be so, right? The purpose is to upset the reader. The purpose is to shake the reader out of complacency with the system as it exists and warn them about what might happen in the future. Um, so th I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that this is a very dystopian vision. It's, it's really upsetting. In particular, um, some of the passages in the book in which uh, the characters are talking about violence and just their comfort with violence perpetrated uh, against enemies of the government, big brother, the state. Right. Um, there's one passage in which uh, one of one of the characters is talking about uh, a, a group of children that set an elderly woman on fire. Other passages in which uh, the characters are talking about executions, uh, killings of, of people who had, were enemies of the state done publicly and how much they enjoy watching them. There's really disturbing imagery and uh, examples that are that are utilized in 1984 so it's it's dark it's bleak um, and it was written by Orwell during one of the darkest periods of his life um, so his wife Eileen had died in 1945 his sister died in 1946 uh, from kidney failure uh, he Orwell himself was extremely ill with advanced tuberculosis so the book was published in June of 1949. Orwell would be dead by January of 1950, only a few months later. Um, he did actually remarry in October of 1949 uh, to his new wife, Sonia, but he was actually so sick by that point that they were married in a hospital room. Um, he was pretty much bedridden at that point. Uh, he was also troubled by the outcome of World War II, he had seen the development of atomic weaponry, a new degree of sophistication in violence and warfare, and he was fairly convinced that the world was on a path to more or less perpetual warfare. Um, so it's a dark, bleak period in Orwell's life, and I think the story reflects that. Uh, he was also troubled with 
the success of Animal Farm. So as we'd mentioned in the previous podcast, Animal Farm launched Orwell into a different status as a writer and into a different level of financial comfort as a writer. I mean, it was a huge, huge global success. And it ensured that Orwell would never really have to worry about money again. Um, but it also meant that he was basically a celebrity, right? And Orwell was intensely private, and he really didn't want that fame and notoriety. So animals, Animal Farm's success had brought him financial comfort, but it also meant that he had public notoriety, notoriety and he didn't really enjoy that. And he found it to be a distraction. In a letter that he wrote to a friend after the publication of Animal Farm, he said, Everyone keeps coming at me, wanting me to lecture, to write commissioned booklets, to join this and that. You don't know how I pine to be free of it all and have time to think again. So he, he was so kind of overwhelmed with the success of Animal Farm that he felt like he didn't have that space in which he could develop his own ideas and just kind of think about things. Um, because of how many people kind of wanted a piece of him. Um, kind of in relation to that, both, you know, his, his um, anxiety, his uh, depression about the, the state of the world post-World War II, but also just his desire to escape fame and notoriety, he moves uh, in 1946 to a very isolated island in Scotland called Jura, um, to live in an old house called Barn Hill. And it's on the northern end of the island. Um, and he moved there with his young son, Richard, his sister, Avril. Um, so he's very sick at this point. His sister's going to help George Orwell take care of his, his son. Uh, and there was also, for a while at least, there was a young writer uh, named Paul Potts. He was a Canadian-British writer, um, poet, and he was in tow uh, for a while. He ended up leaving the island after an argument that he had with George Orwell, in which uh, apparently some of um, Potts' manuscripts ended up in the fireplace. Uh, don't know what the circumstances were, uh, but generally, you know, if, if two writers are in, a, in an argument and then one of the writer's manuscripts end up in the fireplace, that's a pretty nasty argument. Um, Paul Potts, uh, in the 1960s wrote an essay on Orwell, kind of, you know, reflecting back, looking back at Orwell. Uh, and there's a, a great passage that, um, that he, he recounts. Um, a little bit of background to this passage. Jura was completely isolated. Barn Hill was completely isolated. It was a really strange choice for Orwell because he was so sick at the time, right? So imagine you are very, very ill and you move to some place that's um, kind of forbidding in terms of the terrain and getting there uh, and your proximity to you know, hospitals and good doctors. Um, so it was a strange choice for Orwell given that he was so sick. And as I've mentioned in previous podcasts, Jura was very difficult to access. Um, it was about a 48-hour trip from London by uh, train and bus and boat and car to get to Jura. And then once there the actual estate of Barn Hill was pretty difficult to access. There was a seven-mile road um, that was a dirt road. It was unpaved that you had to go down in order to get to the actual uh, house, the actual estate. And so in 1960, the author Paul Potts um, wrote a remembrance of Orwell. It was called Don Quixote on a Bicycle. And he spoke of the difficulty in accessing Barn Hill. So um, he says he, Orwell, carried independence to such lengths that it became sheer poetry. One day on the island of Jura in the Her Her Hebrides, uh, he, we had to move some furniture from the nearest village to his house, a distance of some seven miles over a road uh, that made that famous one leading to the Irish capital look like an autostrada crossing the plains of Lombardy. Some very rich people, friends of Orwell's, who had a hunting lodge on the other side of the island, had a whole garage full of brakes and station wagons and jeeps, five, I believe, yet he refused to borrow the use of one for a few hours. We had to pack those chairs and that table on our backs across seven miles of some of the most beautiful scenery in Europe, this by a man who was a chronic invalid, right? So um, Orwell is moving into Barn Hill and has furniture and <laughs> refuses the use of vehicles to get that 
furniture out there. So they carry these things uh, seven miles down a dirt road to get them to the house. And Orwell, by that time, was very, very sick. Um, so obviously, not only was he sick, he was also incredibly stubborn. Uh, so in any event, it's here, it's in Jura, that Orwell wrote his final masterpiece, 1984. Um, he worked relentlessly, probably far harder than he should have been working, given his ill health. So as a result, um, many have said that 1984 was kind of the final nail in Orwell's coffin. Right? Um, he was so sick, and just the... the strenuous effort that he put into um, finishing 1984. It's a challenging text. It's a fairly lengthy text for Orwell. Um, that kind of pushed him over the edge. There was a 2009 article uh, in The Guardian, a UK periodical, uh, and the title I think is probably accurate. It was um, The title was 1984, The Masterpiece That Killed George Orwell. He was just so sick, so ill at this time. Um, that that kind of would be his last work, his last major work. So the plot of 1984, um, it's a more ambitious literary piece of fiction than Orwell had ever attempted. It tells the story of a character named Winston Smith. He's living in a dystopian society known as Oceania. Uh, and Oceania is a totalitarian society. It's ruled by a party, uh, Ingsoc, uh, that's Newspeak. We'll talk about what Newspeak is in a second, but that's Newspeak for English Socialist, right? Uh, and this kind of mythical leader that it's not even clear whether he's an actual individual or not, uh, but this mythical leader, Big Brother, right? This is a society that's constantly at war. Um, the world endures constant conflict between three major powers, Oceania, East Asia, and Eurasia. And um, the society and the economy are in this constant state of shortage and hardship and suffering. So you see that in the novel. Is it, you know, um, there's a shortage of razors. No one can get razors. And there's rations for things like food. No, people can't get access to certain types of food. The food that is available um, is not great. There's discussions of you know, just kind of this gray, tasteless slop that they have to eat. Um, there's uh, frequent discussions of kind of victory coffee and victory gin, right? And that's the the um, the gin and the coffee that are produced by the state for the people to consume. And it's just not very good, right? It's not very good quality. So there's this constant state of shortage. Um, it says at one point that you know there's a huge percentage of the population that doesn't have shoes, right? Um, in addition to that, society's broken down into a pretty rigid hierarchy. Um, there's 2% of the population which is known as the inner party, right? And the inner party is kind of like the elite. And um, at the top of that elite is Big Brother. He is the leader of the entire society. Then there's the outer party. That's about 13%. And Winston fits in here. He's uh, actually a low-level official at a government ministry called the Ministry of Truth. right? And we'll talk more about what that is in a second. And then you have the vast mass of, of the society, the proles. Right? And prole is um, short for proletariat. It's the working class. It's the, you know, kind of the masses. Uh, and they constitute the overwhelming majority of society. It's about 85% of the society is the proles. Um, so that's the basic backdrop. And really, you're, you're looking at this strict, repressive, totalitarian society viewed through the eyes of the everyman, viewed through the eyes of Winston Smith, right? Trying to grapple with living in such a repressive society. There's a lot of key themes here, um, and I'll highlight a few of the major ones. The first is censorship and control of information. Uh, Winston's whole job, his role at the Ministry of Truth is to scour history and pass communications from the party. And he has to ensure that individuals who have been written out of history, um, they're actually called unpersons, right? So people who, for whatever reason, they engaged in dissent, they um, were 
scooped up by the government and disappeared into a prison. They engaged in you know some form of law breaking and they were executed. These unpersons can't appear in the history of the party. Their history needs to be rewritten, right? So if you had someone who was, you know, say a war hero, and then they fell on the wrong side of Big Brother and the government, you need to kind of alter their history. Um, so um, he does that. He's writing human beings out of history, vaporizing them in terms of their record, changing the facts and the historical record, and uh, disposing of you know, the, the past history or the past writings in this thing called the memory hole, which is basically a grate. You feed that information in, it's consumed by fire, right? So he's a censor. Um, he also changes party communications. Uh, at one point, there's a discussion of uh, the chocolate ration is going to be reduced, right? It is, uh, you know, uh, say 30%, um, that's the figure, and it's going to be reduced down to, um, Twenty-five percent, and he has to rewrite that uh, news release, prior news releases, to say that it was at twenty percent, and we're increasing it by five percent. Right. So he's engaged in that sort of mundane activity. And the interesting thing about Winston is that, although he is a critic of this regime, he finds it loathsome. He finds it horrible. He actually really enjoys his job. He finds it intellectually challenging. He finds it rewarding work. He says it's, you know, sophisticated and difficult and he's good at it and he kind of enjoys doing it. Um, so that's his job, but it, it speaks to the type of society that we're dealing with. It's very, very concerned about censorship, manipulation, shaping information, and rewriting history, right? Reshaping the past. Um, so, so that's one major theme. Second major theme is uh, technology. The government utilizes these, uh, these, you know, technological devices called telescreens. Which it's interesting um, in you know 1946 when Orwell was writing this and, and conceptualizing this. Um, obviously, he's doing so before we have uh, the modern technology that we have today. But he he comes up with this thing uh, called the telescreen. Now, the purpose of the telescreen is kind of twofold. Um, one, the telescreen constantly bombards citizens with propaganda and information about the party. Uh, it tells them about the nation's progress in war. It feeds them misinformation and outright lies about all the great economic progress that they're uh, participating in, that their country's enjoying. Um, so that's kind of the first function. But the telescreens flow the other way. The telescreens enable the government to keep constant watch over their citizens. So it's not just producing information for citizens to consume. It's also consuming information about the citizens. It can see them. It can hear them. There's a telescreen in every apartment of those in the outer party and the inner party. Um, and they can watch what they're doing. They can listen to what they're doing. There's morning exercises in which they have to stand before the telescreen and perform these exercises, and they're critiqued if they don't, you know, touch their toes and things like that. Um, so it's it's kind of a two-way monitor. It sends out information, but it collects information. And they're not just in apartments. They're on city street corners. They're virtually everywhere. So there's a sense that you're constantly being surveilled. You're constantly being watched. And you're also constantly receiving this stream of propaganda and information about Big Brother and the regime and the government, right? And you can't, um, at least with the outer party, <clears throat> um, which Winston belongs to, you can't turn it off. You can turn it down a little bit, but you can't turn it off. So there's no way that you could ever really um, evade the telescreen, or at least it's very hard to do, okay? Um, interestingly enough, the proles... Um, don't have telescreens. Uh, the, the proles, this vast majority of the population, um, they're treated, uh, it says in the book at various points, almost like animals. You don't really need to shape and control them. They're too ignorant. They're too stupid to really rise up. and um, You just need to ensure that um, they're working and they're kept busy, but you don't have to really bombard them with information because there's not very much that they can understand. Um, 
So that's kind of the second major theme, is, is the role of technology in um, shaping and controlling populations. Third major theme is an um, attack on individuality. The entire goal of the government in 1984 and of Big Brother is to eliminate any form of individuality and to ensure that loyalty to the state and loyalty to Big Brother, the figurehead leader, supersedes all other forms of loyalty. And that takes a number of different forms. We see it in the way that youth are socialized. Um, so there are these uh, groups called the spies. There's another group called the Youth League. Um, one, it kind of feeds them misinformation about the government, right? That Big Brother is this father figure and you should be loyal to, loyal to Big Brother over anything else. Um, they develop this kind of rabid sense of nationalism and loyalty to their government and a hatred for you know the countries that they're at war with or the people um, that are deemed enemies of the state uh, namely the major one is uh, a character named Emmanuel Goldstein right um, so there's these these youth organizations the second major function of the youth organizations is to basically act like a surveillance force right so you have children they're socialized into all of this stuff about Big Brother and the government, but they're also collecting information for you. And uh, it's expected, and the children perform this role, that if someone's behaving in a way that's suspicious, or behaving in a way that seems to be disloyal or potentially dangerous, that the children will report them, right? And that happens in, in 1984. You have children reporting their parents, right? And then their parents are taken away by the government um, because their loyalty to the state supersedes their loyalty to the family. We also see an attack on sex. Um, there's mention made of the anti-sex league. There's mention made of celibacy vows, uh, the danger of sex and the pleasure associated with sex, the physical pleasure associated with sex, the danger of romantic love, right? Loving another human being in ways that we would consider to be perfectly normal. Well, that's viewed as dangerous to the state because it's a form of loyalty that might supersede loyalty to the government, loyalty to the state, loyalty to Big Brother. Uh, we see this in the two-minute hate. The two-minute hate, that's um, these very carefully staged events where they basically whip individuals into a frenzy over their hate for enemies of the government, enemies of Big Brother namely Emmanuel Goldstein. Uh, Emmanuel Goldstein was a one-time party member. He betrayed Oceania, um, and he's a frequent target for these, these two-minute hates where people basically go before a screen and are whipped up into a frenzy. Um, and so they'll put images of Emmanuel Goldstein up on the screen, and then people you know, scream and throw things and freak out about that. Uh, Emmanuel Goldstein probably um, meant to to be, uh, you know, a, a kind of representation of Trotsky, right? So Trotsky is a similar dynamic in the Soviet Union. This one-time hero, this person that took part in the revolution and was a leader, and then eventually fell out of favor with Joseph Stalin and became an enemy of the state. Um, similar to the way that Orwell used uh, Snowball in Animal Farm to portray uh, Trotsky, right? Um, so sometimes it's these internal enemies, sometimes it's these people perceived as traitors, sometimes it's it's their external enemies. Uh, so East Asia, Eurasia, these other major powers that they're uh, frequently at war with. Um, sometimes it's East Asia, sometimes it's Eurasia. It changes, although when it changes, uh, people like Winston go back and kind of change the past history, so it seems as if they've always been at war with the same country. They have kind of an eternal enemy. Um, so that's another way in which uh, individuality is uh, shaped or manipulated or, or just kind of eliminated. Uh, thought police, uh, informers, there's an extensive network of people who are carefully scrutinizing others and reporting information that they, um, they deem threatening. And it doesn't even have to be actively conspiring against the government. The thought police refers to reporting people who just seem to be having thoughts or inclinations towards disloyalty. So many of the people who end up as political prisoners 
are not in fact you know openly conspiring or engaged in some sort of um, open revolt against the government they're just thinking about the ways in which they might disagree with the government or they're having doubts about the supremacy of Big Brother and, and you know uh, the English socialist system uh, forced physical activity which we mentioned right um, controlling people's bodies getting them before the telescreen forcing them to do things uh, exercise but also carefully monitoring them and letting them know that you're watching uh, new speak which is fascinating this is another way that that the state tries to get rid of individuality basically it's a strategy to rewrite the language in such a way to make it virtually impossible to even voice dissent and so um, in the section you read for week one there's a conversation between uh, Winston and one of his co-workers Syme and Syme's whole role is to rewrite the language in such a way that it becomes very hard to even articulate or think about um, ways that you could voice dissent against the government so they're actually altering the language changing the language um, fundamentally so that dissent becomes harder and individual expression becomes harder and then lastly um, <clears throat> the torture or disappearance of those who dissent or engage in any form of unsanctioned social activity the idea with um, with this system is that no one engages in any sort of activity the, the lone exception is sleep right but other than that every form of activity that you engage in everything that you do um, you do as part of it's kind of channeled through the state it's channeled through the government you don't engage in individual activity on your own that's actually something that's viewed as very threatening you know to have a hobby to have something that you do that's yours that isn't part of a larger effort by the state they have a word for that in newspeak they call it own life right and so to have you know to be engaged in own life is to be engaged in individual activity separate from the state and it's it's very dangerous you can get in trouble for doing that it's not tolerated so that attack on individuality is a major theme in 1984 uh, just no toleration no level of acceptance for people having their own ideas their own uh, you know passions and motivations outside of the state the last major theme that runs all throughout 1984 and it's kind of the backdrop is this sense of instability of threat of war um, there's a constant state of war in 1984 I mean it seems kind of just perpetual they've always been at war even when they're reporting successes uh, in the war effort on the telescreens and through the media uh, they never say that we're winning the war right they say that we've taken steps to move closer towards potentially having some sort of decisive impact on the war they never even mention an end to the war right it's never that we're going to win the war um, and the constant state of war is used as a way to to justify some of those horrifying invasions of individual liberty so the backdrop is war, threat of attack, and there's um, numerous references also made to the use of atomic weapons that's happened in the past and, and is, on, is ongoing. Right? Um, so obviously kind of a very, um, a very dark vision of um, what society looks like and the way that the government shapes and controls society, the way that the government uh, kind of exerts its influence over society is very heavy-handed very top-down uh, and stepping outside uh, you know the, the control of the government is virtually impossible it's almost like there's there's no escape you can't get outside of their reach right um, so let's talk a little bit about the historical context and some of the events that are shaping 1984 um, Orwell's work is is horrifying but it's not it's not just kind of you know this this kind of vision that he came up with in his head It's definitely reflecting on and commenting on themes that he was confronting in the aftermath of World War II right um, so Orwell is basically envisioning a, a, a future um, that's going to be driven by um, constant war 
between the major powers. He saw the superpowers that were emerging after World War II and their capacity to use this extremely powerful weaponry, right? Atomic weapons, more advanced, uh, you know, air war and naval war than we'd ever had in human history. And he's thinking that the implication of this um, is that we're going to have constant war uh, and and also that this is going to kind of resonate back and have um, domestic impacts within the countries engaged in these wars. And he'd already started to see that. He saw the impact of this in Britain uh, with self-censorship and government manipulation and, you know, kind of a narrowing of the range of acceptable views uh, and acceptable um, thoughts that one could have. So he talked about this in some of the pieces that we read uh, from his World War II reporting, right? That, yeah, there was government censorship, but w what was more striking is that people internalized the censorship. People um, knew what the boundaries of acceptable thought and speech were and didn't kind of reach beyond them to the point where they wouldn't really make reference to very important historical facts or they wouldn't have the courage to advance controversial political opinions. He was really, he was shaken by the, the, the chill that came over, uh, even in his own society, just kind of freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, uh, the way that the press kind of shut down and wasn't critically questioning. So he recognizes that war is an ever-present threat, but then it circles back and it resonates back and it has these impacts on the domestic situation as well. Um, particularly one as regards freedom of thought, freedom of expression. But he's also clearly commenting on Stalin's Soviet Union here. So if Animal, Animal Farm was about the rise of um, Stalin to power, right, how he took a revolution and then kind of um, uh, circumvented, you know, the, the original thrust of the revolution and turned it into something very different, 1984 is the story of Stalin's creation of a totalitarian state. So what do we mean when we say totalitarian? Um, basically, in a totalitarian system, the state holds total authority over the society and seeks to control all aspects of public and private life wherever possible. So it's not necessarily synonymous with dictatorship, right? <clears throat> you can think of dictatorships... Um, that have, yeah, <clears throat> you know, a very powerful state and a very powerful leader or set of leaders. But then there's, there's room for individual freedom. There's privately owned businesses or there's civil society groups or churches or labor unions that kind of fall outside the reach of that singular government. You know, so you can have a dictatorship in which there's still space for other people to... Um, engage in economic activity or social activity or political activity. Um, but in a totalitarian system, everything kind of gets sucked up by the state and channeled through the state and through the leader, right? Um, this is, in a lot of senses, a commentary on the measures that Stalin had taken within the Soviet Union to ensure that dissent and even modes of thinking, which he deemed threatening, were basically impossible. He had a variety of uh, tools at his disposal in order to do that. He utilized uh, surveillance quite a bit, right? Um, this would have been the era in which the Soviet intelligence and secret police apparatus was achieving its most oppressive and um, influential form. He utilized repression outright repression, uh, created a vast network of what were called gulags. They were just these, you know, uh, very, very uh, oppressive and harsh prisons where criminals, but also, you know, um, uh, political prisoners, people who uh, had expressed, you know, dissenting opinions from the party, people that were viewed as threatening in some way, people that uh, had criticized their government were held, sometimes indefinitely. Many of them worked to death. These weren't, you know, just 
prisons where you, you go and you're detained, but these were labor camps in which people were uh, engaged in absolutely backbreaking labor in very, very harsh conditions. Um, he also created a pretty extensive network of informers and spies, right? Um, so it's not just you know the secret police and the KGB, but you also had individuals throughout society uh, who were informing on their fellow citizens. After the Soviet Union fell in 1991, there was this brief period of opening in which the the files of the KGB you know began to kind of leak out piece by piece, and um, that happened in most of the other communist countries that that shifted over you know away from communism. Um, at that at that time, there was a whole wave of uh, countries in Eastern Europe and Central Europe. And the amazing thing uh, about those transitions is that we we learned just the extent of the networks of informers and spies that existed in these countries. And um, we're talking hundreds of thousands of people were either being extorted by the government to provide information about their friends and their family, and their neighbors, and their co-workers, um, or they were on the payroll, right? They were being paid. So it was either, you know, the government had some information on you, and they were using it against you to get you to provide information, or they were simply paying you uh, to provide information. So a massive uh, network of informers and spies. And also, as we talked about, kind of similar to 1984, Stalin said about ensuring that all activities... So social, educational, economic, all of those activities revolved around devotion to the state. So when we think about our own society, we have any number of organizations and activities that are not controlled by the state. You know, as a child, you participate in Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or, you know, youth soccer leagues, youth baseball leagues, you have, uh, you know, the community orchestra, the, the local kind of community theater, um, civil society groups, uh, you know, that work on, on, you know, your church or um, uh, issues that you care about, right? Uh, service opportunities, volunteering. None of those things exist in the same way in Soviet Russia. All of it is, is uh, channeled through the state. And so everything that you're doing even, you know, going hiking, going camping, participating in sports, all of that becomes uh, part of your duty, part of your obligation to the state, right? And has these strong, patriotic, nationalistic overtones. Um, so that's happening. And that's happening, you know, had been happening for a while, but it's, it's um, achieving its, its fullest form right around the time that Orwell's writing. Also, what was particularly striking to... Orwell, and we've talked about this uh, in the past, are the ways that Stalin was manipulating um, not just the present, right? He wasn't just reshaping society, he was, he was manipulating history. He was changing the past. Um, here we see, uh, there's numerous pictures like this. We see an example of a picture with Stalin uh, in which an individual is just kind of blotted out. So the picture on the right that you'll see, um, there's an individual standing alongside Joseph Stalin. And then that picture is doctored to remove that individual, right? So this would have been an individual that um, committed some sort of infraction, had fallen on the wrong side of Stalin, uh, perhaps ended up in you know, a gulag, perhaps disappeared, perhaps was executed, but he just disappears from the picture. They just take him out of the picture. They go back and kind of rewrite history, and they would remove this person's role from uh, major events, from any sort of you know past media reports that that talked about their service to the Soviet Union. And this happened frequently, right? This happened in, on numerous occasions. Uh, we talked about in some of Orwell's previous writing how they wrote uh, Trotsky out of the Russian Revolution altogether. That's a guy that played a major role, played a major role in the revolution and then played a major role in the, the years after the revolution until he was kicked out of the country, but they simply wrote him out of the history books. Um, and they would also doctor images in this way in which they would write people out. So you're writing individuals out of history. Orwell talks about that in 1984. Um, 
this whole category of unpersons, right? People that have been written out of history. Um, and it shows the ways in which you recreate this narrative of the past. Um, this is also a commentary on frustration with the working class. Um, Orwell's frustration with the working class, we see it at various points in the novel. Uh, Winston says, if there's hope, it's in the proles, right? It's in this, this huge mass of people um, that, you know, they're, they're not surveilled in the same way that the rest of society is. They're the overwhelming majority of people. He thinks that, you know, if the proles can just develop a sense of awareness of all the things that are wrong with this regime and devise some way to rise up and fight against it, then, yeah, there can be meaningful social and political change. The proles are the majority of the population. They're not scrutinized as closely as other members of the society. Um, and so Winston goes to areas of the city in which the proles live, and he basically he finds this ignorant, unthinking mass. Um, they're not only incapable of recognizing that they can engage in action against Big Brother, but they're also kind of incapable of thinking in systematic ways that there's anything that they should resist against. They can't even conceptualize the fact that they're living in a, an oppressive society. So what do they talk about? Well, they talk about gossip, and they <laughs> get in violent arguments and have very sophisticated understandings of things like the lottery, uh, or they just engage in empty chatter, you know? Um, but they don't think politically, and they don't think of themselves as a political class, and they definitely don't think structurally about the society as a whole and the ways in which it's unjust and perhaps it should be changed or overturned. So ultimately, this is a comment on, one, the geopolitical context after World War II, but also the domestic political context within those countries. Right? He's saying things not only about um, kind of international affairs, what's happening in terms of the global balance of power, but also just the, the dangerous things that he sees happening within societies, right? Um, so it's, it's, it operates on multiple levels. Um, so it's complex. And Orwell looks at those two dimensions. He looks at, you know, the domestic kind of within country dynamics and the international dynamics and both of them are deeply troubling. Both of them are deeply disconcerting. And so it's one of the reasons why we get such a dark, bleak final book from George Orwell. So um, as we've been doing, let's talk about why 1984 is important. We'll talk about why 1984 is important to understanding Orwell. And we'll talk about why it's important to understanding 20th century life. Um, first off, it's Orwell's final work. Right. So we've been reading his major works more or less chronologically, and this is really the culmination of his career. This is the last major work he's going to produce. And so you can look back in a work like this and see all of the themes that he's been tracing in those earlier texts. Um, that, uh, that dimension of class that I just mentioned, um, the, the fact that, you know, the, the working class occupies itself with uh, the lottery and gossip and chatter. I mean, as you read something like that, think back to uh, Road to Wigan Pier or Down and Out in Paris and London, and you see parallels there because, the, you know, that's really, you know, that's Orwell has been investigating these dimensions of social class for a couple decades now. And if you think back to those works, you can say, oh, yeah, I remember his, his conversations with the working class. And he was always really frustrated, uh, like in, in Wigan, for example. He was really frustrated by the way that he would try to engage them on political issues or just topics that mattered, right? Um, labor, work, workers' rights, uh, uh, support, benefits for workers who are out of work. Uh, and And the working class, in Orwell's mind, really wasn't capable of having that conversation. He Remember in Wigan Pier, he was so frustrated about how they just, they spoke in these truisms, these cliches, you know. Um, he talks about this one woman that he, that he was talking to, and she kept saying, oh yeah, it's, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard, isn't it? It's hard, isn't it? Just repeating the same phrases over and over and over again, and not really capable of having a sophisticated conversation about her 
her position. Um, well, that's basically the same thing that he's depicting in 1984, right? He's really frustrated, or Winston is really frustrated when he goes to talk to the proles and they're incapable of having this more sophisticated conversation that he's interested in having. So it's things like that that you can pick up on now that you've read so much of Orwell's work. And because this is his final work, you can see how these themes, these observations that he's been making throughout his career are now surfacing in his final literary work. So it's important in that sense, right? You can use it to, to understand Orwell, his literary career in its totality and, and his life in its totality. Um, also, here we see Orwell looking to the future, right? And we haven't really seen this. I guess we see it a little bit with um, some of the journalistic pieces that he was writing in World War II, uh, he is thinking about the aftermath of the war, right? What is what is the post-war period going to look like? What will be the eventual impact of World War II on geopolitical relations? Or, you know, can socialism emerge, you know, European, Europe-wide, Western Europe-wide? Um, he is thinking a little bit about the future there. But in general, we haven't really seen this. What we usually see Orwell engaging in is reportage. It's commentary on a situation that has transpired or is in the process of transpiring. Um, so he's, he's looking to the future, and it's a dark vision. Orwell's troubled. He's deeply concerned about the fate of the world, and he's worried about what might happen in the decades to come. And he... he uses this bleak dystopian novel to um, to tell us what he's worried about. Why are these works important to 20th century political life? Um, a few reasons. One, this is a vision of what Soviet communism had become and would become. Orwell's depiction of Big Brother was put forth at a time that we were really only beginning to understand the crimes of Stalin. Remember a few years before he had been an ally, right? And he was still, the British press, you know, you weren't allowed to criticize Joseph Stalin because of his, his effort in World War II, which enabled us to beat the Nazis. Um, what Orwell depicts here turns out to be an eerily accurate description of what the USSR had started to become and would become more fully in the ensuing years. Stalin, when all is said and done, Stalin dies in the early 1950s. Stalin would have been responsible for about 20 million deaths. Uh, and that doesn't include war deaths, right? That's not another 20 million died uh, during World War II. But that's, these are just domestic deaths due to forced relocation, due to starvation, due to uh, mass purges of political dissidents, right? We're talking about 20 million people. By way of comparison... The estimates for Adolf Hitler are about 6 million, right? So just in, t in sheer numbers, uh, Stalin was the uh, more of a mass murderer than Adolf Hitler by a figure of about, you know, 150%. Um, so he's, he's one of the great uh, uh, monsters, of the 20th century. And here, uh, George Orwell is, is depicting pretty clearly just how bad Joseph Stalin was. Um, the KGB, the key Soviet intelligence agency, at its peak employed about a half million people. They worked with hundreds of thousands of informers and sources who were reporting on their friends, their neighbors, their family members. They were um, just uh, recording and uh, archiving massive amounts of private information about individuals within the USSR. So you really didn't have any sort of private life uh, on, under Soviet communism in the Soviet Union. And it was one of the most nightmarish and hideous forms of government ever to exist on the face of the earth. And Orwell recognized that and openly and honestly depicts it here. Right, So while this isn't just about the Soviet Union, it's um, 
clearly influenced by what he was starting to see and what he was starting to learn about the Soviet Union under Stalin. Also, this is a really important book uh, for understanding and analyzing the role of technology in contemporary political life. Uh, the, the phrase Orwellian, right? that term, when we say something is Orwellian, really refers to this book, 1984. And usually if you say that something is Orwellian, you're saying that it combines extreme, extreme political power, centralized political power, with some sort of disturbing use of technology, right? Some sort of disturbing use of technology, surveillance, keeping track of people, watching people, knowing what people are up to. That's what that term usually means in most contexts. Um, so it makes frequent reference to surveillance and spying and manipulation and control. And that's important. Um, I think we're all kind of... Uh, in our, our modern day and age, we have so many gadgets and so many gizmos, and, and technology has shaped and changed our life in such profound ways that we can be um, kind of, uh, we almost have this, this love affair with technology, right? It's often painted as something which liberates us, which frees us, which expands communications and enables us to interact with uh, diverse populations and far-flung far flung populations in new ways. And Orwell here is saying, no, technology is really a double-edged sword, right? Those things that enable greater communication, uh, greater connection, may liberate us, but they can also turn into tools that are used against us. And so we have to remain critical of technology. We have to remain skeptical of technology. We have to be really careful. He saw this in the 1940s and the 1950s with mass communication. He was really concerned about the way that mass communications was potentially changing uh, you know, our, our political systems and the space in which we have for uh, dissent. Right? So we see this with radio, with the emergence of TV, with the emergence of uh, really a global entertainment industry. But we also see this with every new form of technology. And so right now, uh, in the United States, we're dealing with all these revelations of domestic spying, wiretapping, domestic surveillance uh, without the use of warrants, uh, just kind of collecting massive amounts of information. There's a huge, huge government warehouse uh, that is has just become an archive for all of this um, this sensitive information about individuals that the government has been collecting for years now, right? And these were some of the revelations that we've talked about in class, but like um, the NSA's domestic surveillance programs, for example, and some of the revelations from uh, Edward Snowden and, and, and these things. Um, here, we still have that, that, that kind of, you know, that's the double-edged sword of, of technology is, um, yes, the internet is a wonderful, incredibly useful tool, yes, Internet communications um, make our lives easier and make our lives fascinating and rich in ways that they wouldn't be without it. But you're also um, you're also creating this potential tool that the government can use to monitor and surveil you, right? Um, so we we have those concerns. Uh, one of the really interesting things in some of our class discussions, we've been talking about uh, the Arab Spring. Right. And there was this sense that social media played a very, very important role in the Arab Spring. And that's true in a sense. Right. I mean, um, the, the transformations that, that were happening through in numerous countries uh, in North Africa and the Middle East were facilitated by social networking technology. But those things were also used as tools um, at least initially by some of those repressive regimes to crack down on political protesters. And so um, we have to be very careful of thinking of technology in kind of a monolithic, a monolithic way that it only liberates, that it only makes our lives um, easier and better and, you know, kind of frees us because it can also be used as a tool against you. And then the big... And the kind of last question that Orwell's grappling with here, and, and really the probably um, 
the most important question in 1984 is about the possibility of individual freedom. This is um, the great question of the 20th century. Are we free? Can we be free? And as the state becomes more powerful, can we as individuals retain our freedom? So the state, the government, the countries in which we live, um, they're meant to protect us. One of the most fundamental things that a state does for its people is protect them. Right? It protects us from foreign invasion. It protects us from one another. It protects us from force and theft and fraud and violations of our privacy, violations of our basic rights. But it's also the largest single concentration of wealth. It's the largest single concentration of the legitimate use of violence. Um, I mean, think about that for a sec. Uh, Max Weber, a political and uh, social philosopher, uh, said that the, what defines the state, what defines the government, is its legitimate use on the means of violence. Right? And that's basically true. Right? We think of the state as the entity that can um, coerce us through use of force, and that can potentially be legitimate. It can coerce us through imprisonment. It can, uh, for the greater good or for reasons of public health and safety and security, uh, kind of cross over into our individual space and, and look into our private information. I think we would probably all agree that there are certain instances uh, you know, a national security emergency, for example, that some of our individual freedom gets suspended and the government can potentially, you know, uh, adopt more extreme measures to look into our, our private lives. Um, so it's this unique and uniquely powerful entity that has control over our lives. And the hope is that it uses that power and it uses that coercive, um, you know, means of violence for good to protect us and keep us safe. But that also raises this question of um, what what happens if the state turns against you, right? Um, the state has this enormous power and this, this coercive power and it can surveil and spy on us. And can we be free in those circumstances when we have this powerful entity that sometimes we can't control, right? Orwell doesn't answer that question. 1984 doesn't provide you with an answer to that question. It provides you with a very bleak and dark vision of what might happen. But it doesn't answer that question definitively. I think Orwell's hope is that we can have individual freedom. His hope is that we retain that. And so the reason why he, he writes a book like 1984 is to warn us of the dangers of some of the technologies, some of the uh, concentrations of power that are emerging after World War II, but it's very much an open-ended question for him. I don't think he's sure whether or not individual freedom can survive. Um, so those are pretty uh, dense and complex and really disturbing questions, but they're important questions. They're absolutely essential questions. So um, I'll wrap up there. I don't want to say too much. We do spend two weeks uh, on this on this book, and I don't want to say too much about specific characters and the specific plot uh, or give away too much because you'll be reading the first week, which is an introduction to, you know, the main characters and, and what's happening in, uh, in 1984, the state of society. But then if you haven't read 1984, you know, before, um, there's really important developments that happen throughout the book, and, and we won't get to some of those until book two and book three. So really all I wanted to do is provide you with an overview of the major themes and some of the key questions, but I don't want to give away any spoilers or anything like that. <clears throat> um, so we'll wrap up there. Uh, as I said, we spend two weeks. We start with week one uh, by reading book one, and then the second week, week we read books two and three. Um, you have reading questions to help you focus in on what is important. There's a number of different things to focus on here. There's, it's, I think it's a good way to round out our discussion of Orwell for the semester. Uh, like Animal Farm, I would encourage you, if you've read 1984 before, uh, to think about whether it seemed different to you this time. You're reading it at a different point in your life. There's different political events going on, uh, probably. And also you have this experience of 
really, you know, reading 1984 the way it should be read, where you've spent a lot of time building up to it, learning more about, about Orwell, getting a sense of his prior works, and now you're digging into the big, nasty, you know, dark, disturbing final statement of his literary career. So um, I really look forward to, to talking about the the um, book 1984 with you both you know, this week and, and next week. And um, I think there's lots of thought-provoking questions that we'll potentially talk about. So I'll wrap up there. Thanks very much.